Welcome to Falcons Drip, your go-to source for Falcons news and draft coverage. I'm Thon Ray, founder and voice of Falcons Drip. Welcome back, everybody. So tonight we are joined by my co-host, Kyle, and a special guest, Miles Garrett from Fox 5 Atlanta, uh, reporter and producer. What's going on, guys? Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we're, it's a pleasure to have you. So um, if you could just kind of tell us, you know, the moment you knew that you wanted to work in sports. Yeah, so um, in high school, I played football. Um, you know, I figured out kind of quick I wasn't uh, inclined to to play it at the next level. Um, I had a lot of concussions and, you know, I already wasn't good enough as it was. So um, I gave up on that pretty quick, but I wanted to kind of stay up, uh, you know, kind of stay involved with football, stay involved with sports. So I figured the next best option was to uh, become a sports reporter. Um, I actually dm'd or not dm sent a tweet out uh, hail mary to adam Schefter. i remember it when i was a hmm. junior in high school and oddly enough he sent me a private dm wow. saying, you know, work hard do this do that and uh, i thought that was really cool so like ever since he sent me that dm i kind of basically did what he told me to do and uh you know here i am almost 11 years later it's going by quick and you know like i uh in, in our last podcast with daniel flick we also mentioned like how it adults can have such a big impact on kids and just like that one response from one of the biggest names in sports is probably just like huge for you oh 100 percent. yeah i mean he didn't have to take the time to respond but you know the fact that he did certainly uh made a difference for me and uh you know gave me some motivation to to achieve what i wanted to achieve very cool yeah that's really cool to hear about um but we have one branching out from that, um, it's what what made you decide to specifically become a sports reporter at Fox 5? Um, sure. Yeah. No, I mean, as far as Fox 5 is concerned, growing up in Atlanta, uh, Fox was was the, the sports station, still is the sports station, at least to me. I mean, I'm slightly biased, of course, because I work for them. But, um, you know, it, it Atlanta, Fox 5 sort of has always been, to me, the 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 station for Atlanta sports you know you, you had the high five sports thing that they they had when I was a kid you know it was always a big deal when Fox Five Sports came to your high school for the high school football game um, so I always kind of had a soft spot for Fox Five um, but uh, yeah I mean it, it's one of the best sports departments in the entire country not a lot of stations in um, yeah in the entire country have have the kind of staff that we do here a lot of places only have you know maybe two maybe three um you know we have a, a team of almost eight so uh it, it i think it's a big reflection of the product that that we put out there and uh it was a big reason why i wanted to be a part of it and um you know it, it doesn't just happen you've got to certainly work your way up to get to a market like fox 5 and a station like fox 5 in atlanta um the media sort of works by market sizes my first market at a college was macon georgia which was market 137 uh, at the time, I think it's moved up since then. Um, then my second one was South Bend, Indiana. Uh, that was market 98. And uh, then I made the jump to Atlanta, Fox 5. And uh, I'd already had a connection here. I, I interned here um, the summer before my senior year of college. So I already knew a lot of the people here. Uh, it was mostly the same people who I interned with. So they were already familiar with what I did. Uh, so that's really helped my, uh, my case. Very cool. And how did you kind of get that internship? Uh, I mean, I applied. I, I guess I, I made some impression with uh, with my cover letter and, uh, you know, speaking to them on the phone. Um, I always kind of prided myself on being a good interview, not a great test taker. So uh, <laughs> anytime I could get a, a, a interview or a phone call, I figure I do the best in those environments. And uh, I think that's what made the difference. I joke with my now boss now. He, he's the one that got me as an intern. Uh, he said that the, uh, the interview I did was the difference maker. So, I mean, I, I guess that's what I can say. I, that's good for TV. Day. That's good for, for sure. TV. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it helps with the job. But many people who follow sports knows there's many different parts to being a sports reporter. Um, so I want to know what's the favorite, what's your favorite part of being a sports reporter? Yeah, there's a lot of different things. Um, I mean, it, it it can depend on the day, really. I mean, there's a lot of different. I wouldn't say there's 
one thing in particular that's the most fun. Um, I'd say, I mean, covering the, the teams in a big moment is, is it, it, that, that's got to be one of the, the funnest parts. I mean, when, you, when I got to cover the Braves at the World Series, being on the field for the wow. World Series, I mean, that I had goosebumps. I mean, it, I had to pinch myself when I was doing that because, I mean, I mean, I, I wasn't even on the, I mean, I was in the press box, but I was mm -hmm. literally on the field, you know, in the dugout with these guys as they're about to play the World Series in Truist Park. So something I mean, you probably already dream, or something oh, you probably yeah, always I mean, dreamed something of. Something I couldn't even imagine doing, uh, especially yeah. it was you know a few months after I was hired. I guess hired here in twenty twenty one. Guys, been so, gets to cover like, a World Series. That's awesome. Exactly, you know stuff like that, and then you know my first season with the Falcons, getting to interview Matt Ryan. I mean, you know, like ten year old me was like, oh my god, like you know, this was like my hero growing up, and now I'm like a coworker with him basically mm. at this point. Mm, um, for so, sure. You know, so stuff like that um then we'll branch off from there you've you've covered a lot of sports moments can you name like some of your favorites out um i know world series you said was one of your favorites can you name any others yeah the world series is definitely up there um i unfortunately wasn't a part of the travel team for uh georgia on their two national championships i mm. was the uh the guy who was in-house for for those those moments but uh uh, I don't know. I, I mean, it's obvious. It's definitely the World Series. Um, I mean, I, I traveled with the team to LA for the NLCS that year, so that was a cool experience getting to be out in LA for that. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of divisional series things for the Braves. You know, unfortunately, the Falcons and the Hawks haven't really had too much to to really you know go off of the last two seasons. But uh, it has been cool traveling with the Falcons. I got to go to Seattle, Tampa, getting to to see Tom Brady live was pretty cool um, being on the field for the Tampa game um, going to Seattle, like I said, New York city, basically seeing just a bunch of different stadiums and being there on the field and you know, getting to interact with different people uh, covering the NFL combine was actually really cool because, you know, you, you see that you're, you're alongside the who's who of media and you make a lot of cool connections there. Um, I'm sure Daniel probably touched on that, but um, yeah, a lot, a lot of different events that I've covered that uh, certainly stand out. Awesome. And do you have like a favorite Falcons moment for any of those? Favorite Falcons moment. I've got like a hundred questions, but that's probably the best one. No, like. it's okay. Yeah, favorite <laughs> Falcons moment. I mean, it's it was probably right when I started when it was still really mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's not cool anymore, but yeah, know, yeah. Back, back before it became sort of like my day to day job, you know, it, when you got to go to training camp and I had to sit down one on one with Matt Ryan or Arthur mm. Smith or Terry Fontenot and or Michael Vick. I had to had to sit down with all those guys. And um, you know, especially at the beginning, you know, you're just complete awestruck. You know, you have to sort of remember your training and be like, okay, like, you know, I've done all this these interviews with all these other athletes before. It's the same thing. It's just a bigger scale type thing. So you gotta kinda remember you still have a job to do at the end of the day. So, you know, th those those moments probably toward the beginning were yeah, it can be kind of hard for people um, when you first sit, start sitting down and speaking with these athletes, it's like these big stars, and you're like starstruck almost, and, oh, and yeah, it kind of comes sure. to reality. It's a little intimidating at first, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, especially some some of the, the coaches and Arthur Smith. I think Arthur Smith's a great example because he could be a little intimidating because um, <laughs> I interviewed Dan Quinn when I was interviewing him. Dan Quinn was the most you know friendly guy, would always give very yeah. active answers, very, you know, Hey man, like you know that, that type of that type of guy, um, and Arthur Smith. I think he's a great coach. I love him. I think we, we've had some great banter um, off, off the record and everything. But as far as interviews go, and I'm sure you guys are well aware, he is very very dry. So it can be a little intimidating <laughs> to uh, interview him on occasion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we, you know, it sounds like you've always been a Falcons fan, also. Um, uh, yes, uh, I will say, I, I have to always say this because it's true. Like my first recollection of being a football fan was very, very, and I cannot emphasize very briefly, uh, a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan. Oh, no. oh. Growing up, I remember seeing the helmet. That was like mm. the first ever recollection I have of a football helmet. Yeah. And being like, oh, I think the helmet's cool. That's going to be mm -hmm. the team. Again, that was super, yeah. super brief. But, <laughs> no, uh, I, I get it. I actually I used to... Used to Oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say I like, think I like played with them in Madden for mm. a season or two, and then I yeah, I I, I always liked um, 
both Tampa Bay. The Falcons were my number one team, but I, I didn't understand like the rivalries and divisions yet. And I liked right. Tampa Bay and the Raiders because I like their their helmets too. That their logos are pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. definitely had uh the interesting flashback logo. Um, and then they changed to the current one, which is kind of more simplistic. You talking about the Buccaneers? Yeah, the Buccaneers. Oh my god, the uh the alarm clock look was one of the worst in the NFL. I hated that. <laughs> The one with like the cream orange color. And, no, like, those are fantastic. Like, full on person. The creamsicles are fantastic. They need to make those full time. I love yeah. the creamsicles. They I need agree. to bring the throwbacks back out for a game or two. Oh it man, be cool. Now, please, it'd be the one of the best looking uniforms out there. I love the creamsicles because mm-hmm. it'd be unique. No other team has like an those orange uniforms. Like that. You look at them and you're like, that's Tampa Bay mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, the creamsicles. So um, before we go too much into other Falcon stuff, we do have to talk about uh, the big trade that happened today with Jeff Akuda. Uh, what are your your thoughts, and um, how do you kind of how do you think Akuda will fit in to this defensive back room? I think it was a fantastic move, especially for the value. I mean, you only give up a fifth round pick for a guy who was the number three overall pick just a few years ago, and really you haven't seen his full potential. He's been hamstrung by injuries forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, he did pretty decent this past year when he was healthy. Um, and he always wanted, he, apparently he is a big Falcons guy. So I mean, maybe he, he gives a little extra, you know, effort. I don't know if there's anything to that <laughs> when he's with Atlanta, but you know, it's something you like to think about. Yeah. But um, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of depth now in this secondary that you didn't previously have. Now you have AJ Terrell, Casey Hayward, Mike Hughes, Jeff Akuda, Jesse Bates, you know, Grant, all these different guys that you have in the secondary. Now you have options. You know, if one guy goes down, the other guy can come in. Uh, I do think, I, I know that there's still a chance. I do think this takes them out of the cornerback sweepstakes for pick number eight. Um, it's just a vibe. Like they, they very well could, you know, take a guy like Christian Gonzalez or Devin Witherspoon if they're available at that spot. Mm-hmm. But I think this move, you know, you add two guys at cornerback this offseason and add another guy at safety, that to me tells me that you're kind of set at that position. Um, so I, I don't necessarily think they're going to go that route, but I do think adding uh, Jeff Okuda shows that Terry Fontenot is committed to building depth for that uh, mm-hmm. area, perhaps not even just depth, adding another starter opposite A.J. Terrell. Um, and I think it's just another move for what he's done to basically completely transform this defense. This is going to be a completely new defense to what we've seen the last few years. I, uh, we were doing a Twitter space earlier today talking about the move, and um, I was looking at some of the stuff, and I, I think this cornerback room is about six players deep. Um, you got A.J. Terrell, uh, Casey Hayward, Jeff Okuda, Cornell Armstrong, Mike Hughes, D. Alford, which are all all solid guys. Darren Obviously, Hall. Alford hasn't quite been crazy good in the NFL. He hasn't gotten a lot of run in the NFL, but he was great in the CFL. And um, same with your point that Falcons probably won't go corner at the eighth, eighth pick. I was saying that earlier today, and I was saying if Falcons possibly pick a quarter cornerback, it'll be like – seventh round um or at earliest in my opinion yeah i I could see them maybe going out i mean i I could see them going a little bit earlier than that i know they're they've reportedly i don't know how big reportedly but i've heard reportedly that they have a lot of interest in maybe cam smith of south carolina Mm -hmm. um i could see them maybe taking a guy like him in the second round perhaps if he falls in their lap um, but yeah, I, I, you know, they, they very well could add more. I mean, who knows? Maybe you, maybe you had another one via free agency, um, or the draft, you know, there's still a lot of time left. I mean, I don't think anyone saw this Akuda move coming today. So that one kind of, it kind of surprised a few of us. So, um, yeah, who, who knows where they're going to go next? I'm not um, totally and- sold on them not getting a cornerback at eight, but I'm, uh, I'm at that point where I'm like, Hey, the possibility that they get a cornerback there is unlikely, and it's more likely they'd go for a guy like on day three, maybe earlier, but it's less likely now than it was True. earlier in this draft process. I think too, like the another thing to realize is that both 
Akuda, they're probably not going to pick up his fifth year option. And then Casey Hayward, they're both on one year deals. And Mike Hughes is on a two year deal, but he can be easily cut next year. So, I mean, I think it just depends on what they value. I, I agree with you, Kyle. Like, I don't think that they're going to go corner, but they, I, it all, I think they still could. Um, less feels less likely, but I just feel like with everything that this team has done, that, you know, it doesn't matter to Fontenot. He's just going to go with the best player available, no matter where it is. I think that there will probably be better, not better players, but similar, if they're like a similar players at maybe edge or guard or, you know, some might say running back. Uh, and then you then you take a guy there instead of the corner. But who, who knows? Um, I'll yeah. also add that um, the Falcons could draft a guy late on day three with traits and try to stash them on the practice squad. Mm-hmm. Um, that could yeah. be a strategy. And also Kadero Hodge, uh, that was an interesting move today. He was signed back for, what was it? Do we have the contract details? I, I can't remember the contract. Yeah, I believe it was, it was like a one year deal. Yeah, one year like deal. One it was like one point zero four million, I believe. But okay, because... that's a, that's what I was thinking. I couldn't remember right off. But it, but that's um, a good special teams player and a good depth piece at receiver. Yeah, I, I'm pumped that they brought him back because I feel like he could have done so much more as a receiver just with how explosive he is. Um I think he's a great wide receiver four or five special teams guy. Um, so that, that was that was awesome to see him come back. Yeah, I agree. I like Daryl Hodge. Um, so Miles, got to ask you about Miles Mock. Um, whose idea was it to come up with that? Um, because you know it just rings. It just sounds nice, right? Miles <laughs> Mock, the alliteration. Um, is there any meaning for the order that we're coming out in? I know we're at three point Um, do you like the last ones the most? Um, and then I'll ask you, you can answer those and then we'll talk about like who you want them to take versus who you think they're going to take at eight. Sure. Yeah, no, the, the miles is mock thing was actually an idea from my boss, um, because, um, I've, I've been basically since the combine was starting to get a lot of traction from a lot of my NFL tweets regarding the Falcons. So, mm-hmm. um, they thought it'd be a good idea to, to capitalize on that and maybe, you know, tweet out some more uh, content basically in regards to the draft and prospects and whatnot. So uh, the miles is my thing, I guess was my idea. It was just sort of, you know, come up with something type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, yeah, no, there's not really a particular order to it. It's more, basically I've got, uh, there's only one bit. So there's one more prospect I'm going to talk about. And then after that, I'll have my final mock draft type thing. Mm -hmm. Getting up to the top. Um, so yeah, th- there's not really a particular order for the prospects. It's basically just four guys who I think that the Falcons should slash will be targeting or on their radar type thing. Um, that that's kind of what it is. There's not really any you know order to it, like I'm mm-hmm. saying. But um, yeah, I, I mean, it's funny since I started it versus now. There's been so many different moves to where I think that. I guess not necessarily the guys who I've already talked about aren't off the board yet, but maybe mm-hmm. some things have changed. Um, and I think there's scenarios now with the Falcons where, you know, you, you they could honestly pick up any type of player and you could be like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like depending on what, like it could be any position really. Like, I mean, I don't think they will and I don't want them to, but I mean, they could pick up a quarterback at pick number eight. And I, and I think most people, not most people, but, there could be an argument to be like, yeah, that makes sense if someone fell there or something. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, just the way this roster has been constructed, especially this offseason, there's a lot of different options you can open yourself up to. Uh, that being said, I think where we stand right now, again, it is sort of subjective to where certain guys end up. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the best case scenario for the Falcons is four, four quarterbacks go before their pick. Because if four quarterbacks go before your pick, you're going to get at least one elite defensive player. Um, I don't think Will Anderson or Jalen Carter falls to them. I think those two guys will get picked up before their pick. Do the Falcons take a guy like Jalen Carter if he falls to them? I don't know. I was told by a couple different people at the NFL Combine that, you know, again, this was before his pro day, which he Mm -hmm. didn't do very well at. 
um, that, you know, even with all this, if he falls to pick eight, the Falcons wouldn't pass up on him. But it's been, you know, two months now since since I was told that things yeah. change. Um, so I don't know. I, I do think there's a good chance if Jalen Carter is available that you take him. Uh, I feel the same way about Tyrese Wilson. Uh, you know, I think that's another guy who, or Tyree Wilson, excuse me, that would be available that you they probably would pick him up. So I'm operating off the assumption that Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson, and Jalen Carter will all be off the board. If that's the case, I think if you don't trade down and you stay put at pick number eight, I think I'm going to stay with my last mock, and I think they take a guy like Lucas Van Ness because I don't think you take a cornerback anymore based on what they did today because otherwise I would have said Christian Gonzalez probably would have been the pick. But you add another cornerback to that room. You add Calais Campbell. You need another edge rusher potentially. Calais Campbell also not getting any younger. Uh, He's a little bit on the older side. Um, I just think that the main thing with Lucas Van Ness, I think he fits their scheme really well. I, mm-hmm. I think uh, he and Ryan Nielsen meshed pretty well at the combine when they met. Uh, they were reportedly, I don't know if this is confirmed, had a private workout this week. I don't know how well that went. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if I had to make a pick today, that's probably who I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, that may change in the coming weeks, but that's who I would probably say today. Um, but you know, you certainly open up the possibility of a trade down. You know, that could that could happen too. Say four quarterbacks don't go in the top eight. Maybe a team wants to come up and get a guy like Will Levis. Um, so you never really know what could happen. Um, but uh that being said, yeah, I mean maybe B. John Robinson's a guy that you yeah. can do I think I think if four quarterbacks go before a I also think now um I would not be shocked if the lines are leaning more towards a cornerback with kind of they this, need one now. Yeah, yeah, with the trade of Akuda. Um so I mean in that scenario, one of those three guys, Will Anderson, Tyree Wilson, or um Jalen Carter falls to Atlanta. I also and, and I, I I feel like I'm the biggest Nolan Smith guy and I wasn't and I, I want to come out straight and come out and say too like I'm I root for Georgia, but I'm not a Georgia fan. If that makes any sense, like I'm not sure. a home I'm not this Homer person who's you know banging the table for Nolan Smith because I root for Georgia. Um, but just you know, a chart came out like a couple of weeks ago that I was looking at for Nolan Smith and just seeing his um, run stop rate plus his pressure rate. Like his pressure rate was higher than all the defensive ends last year. Like he was at um, let me pull it up quick. He was at a sixteen point three pressure rate. Um, which was better than Thibodeau, who had a 14.2. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, who's a 13.3. Trayvon Walker was an 8.8. Um, the only person who's got a higher pressure win rate than him um, is Will Anderson. So, I don't know. That. Yeah, you throw that in with the traits, and then my biggest thing, too, with him is the mental makeup. Like That's the thing that Terry Fontenot talks about more than anything else. So that's why I've kind of been a huge nolan smith guy in the last couple of weeks and I, starting to even i think i would take him over tyree wilson i don't know if he fits i don't know if he fits atlanta's defense better or if he fits what they're looking for but i think just as an overall prospect i think i like nolan smith better than tyree wilson yeah on, on this pod we've been talking about nolan smith constantly it feels I, like I think, yeah i think it's my fault <laughs> and every time we talk about the draft we're talking about nolan smith smith as a possible first round pick we absolutely love his leadership and um, what he brings on the field. He's a solid run defender, and he's also got that um, speed to where he could go back in coverage and cover a guy, a running back out of the backfield, or he can rush the passer with a speed rush, and maybe you can develop some moves to make him better, and maybe he can gain a little weight to be uh, more solid and be able to not get bullied by bigger offensive linemen. Yeah, no, I can, I can see that. I mean, there's there's a lot to like. I think a lot. The, one of the biggest things to like about Nolan Smith is his uh, off the field characteristics. I mean, he's been the leader of this defense I mean, the last two seasons. You know, I got to see it see it up close and personal, covering the team, uh, just mm-hmm. seeing what he's been doing. Especially while he was hurt, he was still coaching up these guys on the sidelines. So, 
Uh, I think Nolan, you, you bring up that mental makeup. He brings a lot of that to the table when it comes to the Falcons. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been constantly talking about how Georgia, once he got injured, they kept um, they have the seventy man roster for um, road games, and they would always bring him because he was such a good leader. He was basically another coach on that side. He was yeah, hundred percent. So with that, we'll move on to something. Uh, we're going to talk about some of your interviews and I know you've done a couple. So um, what are some of the most like un- uplifting and inspirational ones you've done? Yeah, no, I can say three immediately come to mind. Um, it was my first one definitely is the, uh, the trade battle Mark Rick story I did, um, which uh, I had to do a lot with, uh, you know, men's mental health um, speaking with, with Trey and Mark Rick um, was very powerful. You know, they were both very emotional during the interview and uh, it was very, it was re- just a really powerful interview. You know, you can kind of feel it when you're in these things. Um, especially a guy like Mark Rick, you know, growing up, seeing him and seeing the influence he has on, on athletes and, uh, and just, you know, regular people throughout the state. He was a big one. Um, additionally, uh, Quentin Moses' family. Um, I did a story on Quentin Moses, the former Georgia uh, player who tragically died a few years ago in a house fire. Um, I interviewed his family, just kind of talking about his legacy that he left behind. Uh, that was a pretty powerful interview, just speaking to his family, getting to know the kind of person that Quentin Moses was. Um, you know, he's a fierce protector, uh, fierce family member, that kind of thing. You know, you, you just learn a lot about a person when you really dissect them and, and you know speak to those who, who love them the most. And uh, third one probably would be my interview with uh, Reggie Ball, the former Georgia Tech quarterback, um, who uh, uh, a story I did on him with a uh, basically a fan that he had while he was still at Georgia Tech who uh, tragically passed away while he was there. He had a really strong impact on this kid. Um, it was Reggie Ball is basically this kid's hero. Um, and uh, hearing, you know, the kid's family talk about Reggie and hearing Reggie talk about the kid, um, you know, it was, it was pretty emotional sort of hearing how each thought of each other. And uh, you know, it's something that sort of transcends sports when you have conversations like that. And I'll, I'll just go deeper into the Trey Battle uh, thing. What were your like feelings when you were making the piece? Like, um were you like emotional like when you were making it or was there any- yeah, I mean it, you you try to separate your emotions from doing your job I mean I, I've that's kind of something that is taught you know when you're in school and when you're doing your job is you know you, you deal with a lot of emotional things you know I've been a, a news reporter for a lot of my career and you know, I've had to do murder stories and you know, things like that that can be pretty heavy so you, know, you try to sort of separate yourself from it a little bit, um, not so much, especially when it comes to stories, because you still want to add emotion to it or keep that emotion there, because that's what makes you better storyteller. You know, when you relate to the person, you can kind of tell their story better in a way that uh, relates to somebody. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it. Uh, I was emotional while making it. Um, it was more I wanted to get it right. Uh, I wanted to make sure the story was told the best way possible. And his message was, you know, I mean, he trusted me to tell a story. So I wanted him to make sure I, I did it right and, and told it the right way. I love that. How do, so how do you not, like, as a reporter, how do you not take some of the stuff home with you? That's a good question. I mean, it, uh, it, I guess it's just reps, you know, the amount of stories you do, they all kind of, I don't want to say they blend together, but I mean, after a while, you sort of just, you know, you learn to kind of deal with it and you learn to kind of move on to the next thing. I mean, you, you certainly take lessons from things. I mean, I, I've learned a lot of motivational things from coaches and players I've interviewed. Um, but, uh, you know, I do my best try not to take work home with me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I try to have a little bit of a, you know, maintain a, a semblance of sanity when I'm, when I'm home. I try yeah. to, you know, not be completely consumed by work, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard not to. Yeah. Unfortunately, we won't have more interview and this is the end of the episode. So I really hope y'all enjoyed, but this episode got cut short due to um, technical difficulties on my part. Um, So I, I got that fixed now and we'll have it fixed for the next episode. 
but this episode we had to cut out a couple questions and the rapid fire sec uh segment so um please be sure to follow miles at miles garrett tv on twitter and miles m garrett on instagram and i really hope y'all have a good day and let's get to the outro Again, this is Thon Ray. You guys can follow us at Falcons underscore drip on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Please make sure you subscribe, follow, whatever you need to do to get the alert for our next episode. If you guys enjoyed today, please leave us a review. It always helps us grow. Until then, see you next time. Rise up.